Guys, we are reading, sorry, my voice is like really bad, but I'm going to just try to read this. <clears throat> um, we are reading The Little Women by Louisa M. Alcott. Um, and I'm just going to start reading. Sorry about my voice, guys, but I haven't done this for a second, so I'm just trying to update you guys. In chapter 17, Little Faithful. For a week about a mile, a uh, verter and the old house would have supplied the neighborhood. It was amazing for everyone, seemed in heavenly frame of mind, and self-denial was all fashion. Relieved of their first anxiety of their father and girls, incidentally, relaxed their praiseworthy efforts a little and began to fall back into old days. Joe caught a, ba a bad cold through neglecting, neglecting to cover the shorn head enough and was ordered to stay at home till she was better. Joe liked this and subsided on the sofa to the nurse. The cold with arsenicum and books, Amy found that housework and art did not go well together and returned to her mud pies. Meg went daily in her kingdom and sewed at home. But much time was spent in writing long letters to her mother or reading the Washington dispatches over and over. Beth kept on with only slightest relapses into idleness and grieving. All the little duties were faithful, done each day, and many of her sisters also, for they were forgetful, and the house seemed heart got heavy with longings for mother and fear for father. She went away into a certain closet, hid for her uh, her face in the folds. I want to see how long this chapter is. I don't think it's that long. Yeah, it's not that long. Um, of a certain dear old gown and made her little moan and prayed her little prayer quietly by herself. Nobody knew what cheered her up after the silver fit, but everyone felt how sweet and helpful Beth was and fell into a way to, of going to her for comfort. For advice and her small affairs, all were unconscious that this experience was a test of character. And when the first excitement was over, felt that they had done well and deserved praise. So they did. But this mistake was in ceasing to do well. Meg, I wish you'd go and see the Hummels. You know, Mother told us not to forget them, said Beth. Ten days after Miss March's dis, uh, departure, I am too tired to go this afternoon, replied Meg, rocking comfortably as she sewed. Can't you, Joe? asked Beth. Too stormy for me, with my cold. I thought it was most well. It's well enough to go out with Lori, but not well enough to go to Hummel's said Joe, laughing but looking like a little shamed. Why don't you go yourself? asked Meg. I have been every day, but the baby is sick, and I don't know what to do for it. Miss Hummel goes away to work, and Lachin takes care of it, but it gets sicker and sicker, and I think, or, uh, I think you or Hannah ought to go. Beth spoke earnestly, and Meg promised she would go tomorrow, asked Hannah, for some nice little mess, and take it round. Beth, the air will do you good, said Joe, adding, apologetically, I'd go, but I want to finish my story. My headaches, I'm tired, so I thought maybe some of you would go, said May, uh, Beth. Amy will be presently, as she will run down for us, suggested Meg. So Beth lay down on the sofa, and others returned to their work, and Hummels were forgotten. An hour passed. Amy did not come. Meg went to her room and tried on a new dress. Joe was absorbed in her story, and Hannah was sounded asleep before the kitchen fire. 
Then Beth quickly put on her hood, filled the basket and odds and ends for the poor children, and went out into the chilly air with a heavy head and a grieving look at her patient's eyes. It was late. She came back, and no one saw her creep upstairs, upstairs, and shut herself in her mother's room. Half an hour after, Joe went to mother's closet for something, and there found Beth sitting on the medicine chest, looking very grave and red eyes, and a camphor bottle in her hand. Christopher Columbus, what's the matter? cried Joe, as Beth put out her hand as if warn her off and asked quickly, You've had scarlet fever, haven't you? Years ago, when Meg did. Why? Then I'll tell you. Oh, Joe, the baby's dead. What baby? Miss Hummels, it's dead in my lap before she got home, cried Beth with a sob. My poor dad. It's my poor dead. How dreadful for you. I ought to have gone, said Joe, taking her sister in her lap as she sat in the her mother's big chair with a remorseful face. It wasn't dreadful, Joe, only so sad. I saw it in a minute that it was sicker, but Lachin said her mother had gone for a doctor, so I took baby and let Lottie rest. It seemed to sleep, but all of a sudden it gave a little cry and tremble, and then lay very still. I tried to warm its feet, and Lodi gave it some milk but it didn't stir and i knew i knew it was dead don't cry dear don't d what did you do i just sat and held it softly till miss Hummel came with the doctor he said it was dead and looked at henrich and minna who had some sore throats scarlet fever ma'am ought to have called me before he said crossly miss Hummel told him she was poor and had tried to cure the baby herself. He smiled then and was kinder, but it was very sad, and I cried with them till it turned, till he turned all of a sudden and told me to go home and take the Beldana right away, and I'd have the fever. No, you won't, cried Joe, hugging her close with a frightened look. Oh, Beth, if you should be sick, I never could forgive myself. Don't be frightened. I guess I shan't have it badly. I looked in Mother's book and saw it began with headache, sore throat, and queer feelings like mine. So I did take some Bellandana, and I feel better, said Beth, laying her cold hands on her hot forehead and trying to look well. <coughs> Sorry, guys. If mother was only at home, exclaimed Joe, seizing the book. She read a page, looked at Beth, felt her head, peeped into her throat, and then she gravely, I'm afraid you're going to have it, Beth. I'll call Hannah. She knows all about the sickness. Don't let Amy come. She never had it, and I should hate it to give it to her. Can't you make I have it all over again? Asked Beth anxiously. I guess not. Don't care if I do. Serve me right, selfish pig. And let you go. And stay writing rumblish myself, muttered Joe. As she went to consult Hannah, a good soul was wide awake in a minute and took the lead at once, assuring Joe that there was no need to worry. Everyone had scarlet fever, and if rightly treated, nobody died, all in which Joe believed and felt much relieved as they went up to call Meg. Now I'll tell you what we'll do, said Hannah. When we had exclaimed a question, Beth, we will have Dr. Bangs just look at you, dear. Then we'll send Amy off to Aunt Marches for a spell to keep her out of the harm way, and one of you girls can stay at home and assume amuse Beth for a day or two. I shall stay, of course. I'm the oldest, began Meg, looking anxious and self-approachable. I shall, because it's my fault she is sick. I told Mother I'd do the errands, and I haven't, said Joe decidedly. Which will you have, Beth? There ain't no need but one, said Hannah. Joe, please. And Beth leaned her head against her sister with contented look, which settled the point. I'll go and tell Amy, said Meg, feeling a little hurt, yet rather relieved of the ho on the whole. For she did not like n nursing, and Joe did. 
Amy rebelled outright and declared that she had rather have the fever than go to Aunt March. Meg left in despair to ask Hannah what she, uh, what should be done. Before she came back, Lori walked into the parlor to find Amy sobbing with her head in the sofa cushions. She told her story, expecting to be consoled, but Lori only put his hands in his pockets and walked about the room, whistling softly. Presently, he sat down beside her and said in his most wheedlesome tone, now be a sim, uh, sinable little woman, and hear what a jolly plan I've had, what I've got. You go to Aunt March's, and I'll come to take you out every day, driving and walking, and we'll have capital times, but it's dull at Aunt March's, and she is so cross, said Amy, looking rather frightened. It won't be dull with me popping in every day to tell how Beth is, and take you out to Galifantine. Will you take me out in the trotting wagon with Puck on my honor as a gentleman and come every single day? See if I don't and bring me back the minute Beth is well and I, um, intentionally minute and go to the theater truly. Well, I guess I will, said Amy slowly. Good girl, sing out for Meg and tell her you'll give in, said Lori. Meg and Joe came running down to behold the miracle which had been wrought, and Amy felt very precious in her self-sacrificing promise to go. How was the little uh, little dear, said Lori, with Beth, for Beth was his special pet. She is laying down on Mother's bed and feels better. The baby's death troubled her, but I dare say she has only got cold. Hannah says she thinks so, but she looks worried, and that makes me fidgety. Fidgety, answered Meg. What a trying word is this world, is it? said Joe, rumbling up her hair in a fruitful way. No sooner do we get out of one trouble than down comes another. Well, don't make a porcupine of yourself. It isn't becoming settled of your wig, Joe, and tell me if I shall telegraph to your mother or do anything. As Lori. What is, uh, that is what troubles me, said Meg. I think we ought to tell her if Beth is really ill. But Hannah says we mustn't, for mother can't leave father, and it will only make them anxious. Beth won't be sick long, and Hannah knows just what to do. Hmm. Well, I can't say. Suppose you ask grandfather after the doctor has been. We will, Joe. Go and get Dr. Bangs at once, commanded Meg. We can't decide anything till he has been. Stay where you are, Joe. I'm errand boy to this establishment, said Lori, taking up his cap. <sighs> Dr. Baines came, said Beth, had symptoms of the fever, but thought she would have it lightly, though he had looked sober over Hummel's story. Amy was ordered off at once and provided with something to ward off danger. She departed in a great state, which Joe and Lori has escorted. Aunt Marge received them with her unusual hospitality. What do you want now? she asked, looking sharply over her spectacles, while the parrot sitting on the back of her chair called out, Go away! <laughs> oh my God. Go away! No boys allowed here! Lori retired in the window, and Joe told her story. No more, I expect. <clears throat> if you are allowed to go poking about among poor folks, Amy can stay and make herself useful. If she isn't sick, which haven't no doubt she will be. Looks like it now. Don't cry. It worries me to hear people sniff. Amy was on the point of crying. But Lori slyly pulled the parrot's tail, which caused Polly to utter the extinguished croak and call out, Bless my boots! In such a funny way that she laughed instead. What do you hear about, what do you hear from your mother? asked the old lady gruffly. 
Father is much better, replied Joe, trying to keep sober. Oh, he is? Oh, is he? Well, that won't last long, I fancy, Marge. Never had any stamina, was the cheerful reply. Ha ha, never say die. Take a pinch or a snuff. Goodbye, goodbye. Swaddling Polly, dancing in her perch, clawing at old lady's cap. Hold your tongue, you disrespectful old bird. And Joe, you better go at once. It isn't proper to be gonding about so late with a rattle padded body boy like. Hold your tongue, you disrespectful old bird, cried Polly, tumbling off the chair with a bounce of running to the peck and rattled painted boy, who was shaking with laughter at the late speech. I don't think I can bear it, but I'll try, thought Amy, as she was left alone with Aunt March. Get along, you are a fright, screamed Polly, and at that rude speech, Amy could not restrain a sniff. And that is the end of chapter 17. We will do chapter 18 later on. Thank you guys for listening. I'm sorry about my horrible voice, but yeah, have a great day, guys.